It's the voice of Indiana County, WCCS, AM 1160 and 101.1 FM. And our conversation with Tom Butzler is brought to you by Marcus and Mack, a law firm representing injured people. And no, Tom is not Bob Pollock, but he is with us this morning. Tom is from Clinton County, extension agent there. And uh, we're talking bees today. Tom, good morning. Good morning. It's good to have you with us here today. Yes, thank you for having me on. I bet you a lot of people don't know how big of an industry the bee industry is in Pennsylvania. Penn State has the Center for Pollinator Research. They have a wonderful resource online that you can find out all about them. But uh, you're a guy that uh, you know your bees, and so let's talk a little bit about them. This is their season, isn't it? This is when they're starting to emerge and looking to get fed. Yeah, you know, if if this rain stops a little bit uh, today, um, it's going to be warm enough. They're going to be active and out foraging. And for those folks who want to venture outside today, uh, you'll see some tr- um, trees in bloom right now, and specifically um, the, the maple trees. Not big flowers, mm-hmm. but um, th- they are uh, flowering open, and the bees are actively foraging on those flowers. Now, it's not so much for the nectar coming out of those uh, maple flowers, but uh, that's a great early pollen source. Uh, for these honeybees they'll take that pollen back and right now inside those hives um, they are that queen has been actively laying eggs they are um, uh, emerging and that those young honeybees the larvae are are fed high quantities of uh, this pollen it's their protein source so yeah that's really critical right now for these bees to, to to bring in um, a lot of this pollen. Tom, take us right back to the very basics. If, if I'm a young kid and I'm wanting to learn about bees and, and what they're doing now, uh, and you talked about going back to the hive right now, if, if I'm a student in first or second grade and I want to know where the bees are right now, where they live and how they live, what do I do? What, what do you tell me? Well, I mean, you, you could go two ways with this. I mean, if you look at their, uh, their natural uh, habitat or, you know, if they're out there in the wild, they're living mostly in these hollowed-out uh, uh, tree trunks or parts of a tree. Um, they, they're not native to the United States. They're, they're European honeybees, so over in um, that, that area. Um, but in the wild, before man, it, man kept them, uh, they live in these hollowed-out um, uh, trees. Now, you know, over the centuries or millennium, they, um, man has uh, managed them, and we put them in these boxes for the most part. And we kind of—it's no different than any other livestock. We're managing them to, to produce um, maybe honey or collect pollen. People eat that. So you know, you, you go down uh, two of those uh, pathways on on how they exist out there. But most folks are keeping them in boxes, and um, you know they're they're coming out of winter, and um, they're they're starting to actively um, you know progress through their life cycles. Now, for someone that's interested in getting um, into beekeeping, there are a couple ways to go with that. Um, one is to work with an established beekeeper and maybe buy a, an established hive off of them. Uh, the other way uh, is to order these packaged bees. There's a huge, huge industry hmm. um, that produces bees, and they'll either ship them to you in the mail or other beekeepers go buy them in bulk and bring them up north. And in these package of bees will be about, uh, what, maybe 10,000 bees and one queen. And they're in this package. It's well ventilated, and you just basically dump them into your uh, empty box uh, that you've constructed, and then you go from there. <laughs> the third way to do that is what we call nukes, and nukes means uh, it's abbreviated for nucleus colony. And this is basically a, a mini beehive that has been started by beekeepers, and they usually sell those uh, later in the season, later than you get packaged bees. Mm-hmm. So those are the. I, and I guess the fourth way to start this is just kind of. Wait until the season progresses, and maybe you'll come across a swarm of honeybees. Typically, swarms occur um, when uh, the population in a uh, a managed colony or in a tree trunk uh, gets so large, or something's going on in that hive that they 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 they'll, they'll split in half and go start another um, uh, colony elsewhere. So you could capture that swarm, and that's free. Uh, yeah. I mentioned package bees. Package bees right now, I think, are ranging one hundred and twenty dollars getting pretty pricey yeah um so you catch a swarm and that's free free money <laughs> there you there you go for others who uh, you know might be quite aware of bees and their origins maybe you can explain how important they are to our agriculture industry particularly i'm thinking of uh, commercial farmers yeah so 
you know, everyone thinks of honey when they think of honeybees, but really um, in agriculture, they're pretty important for moving that pollen from the, from the male flower or the male part of the flower uh, to the female flower or the female part of the flower. And, and that's how we get the products that we eat. So, for example, uh, some crops are more important than others. And for a lot of our farmers here in Pennsylvania, uh, the two that come to mind are our apple growers and our um, cucurbit growers. And cucurbits could be our pumpkins, uh, watermelons, uh, cucumbers, and so forth. Mm-hmm. And you need that pollen moving around. It's not moved by wind. There are some uh, plants that uh, just rely on wind movement and pollen, and they do fine. But the pollen in some of these plants are, are a little heavier and a little stickier, and so they don't move through wind real, real well, and we ro- rely on these insects picking up that pollen from one flower and moving um, to uh, uh, another flower and dropping that um, pollen off. So um, apples uh, require uh, pollinators. Now, I do have to say there's been a, a lot of research going on, and we're really exploring these native pollinators and their effect on moving pollen around. And um, that's showing some promise. Maybe we need to, maybe we can rely a little less on on honeybees um, uh, to do some of this work. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're talking but, about what there, butterflies and those well, sorts of things. Well, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of pollinators. Uh, there's butterflies. There's beetles. There's our native pollinators. So let's look at um, pumpkins, for example. That's a big fall crop. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yes, we can bring managed bee colonies into a pumpkin field, and you know you've got. At that time of the year, you might have a, a, a workforce of 40,000 uh, honeybees, and they will move that pollen around. Mm-hmm. But we have uh, the native squash bee. I mean, it's native to the southeast part of um, uh, the United States, but or southwest. But you have the native squash bee. They are great pollinators uh, for our cuc- cucurbits, such as pumpkins. And then bumblebees are also, um, our native bumblebees are also effective at moving that around. So if maybe we can manage and encourage this native population of uh, pollinators, uh, they can pick up some of the uh, slack um, uh, from the uh, honeybees because we really haven't touched upon it, but the honeybees are just being hammered with uh, uh, several different issues. And it's, it's getting difficult to, 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 to you know, get these honeybees to survive year after year. Now, well, that's where I wanted to go next. And, again, we're talking with Tom Butzler. He's from Clinton County, pinch hitting for Bob Pollock today, our extension agent. Uh, Tom, the bee colony... Uh, disaster of the last 10 years uh, is, well, I don't know that it's abated all that much, but I know Penn State's right on top of it. Bring us up to date. Yeah, so you, you, you said it. it. It has not abated. It's, it's kind of a, I, I call it a mess. It, when There's a survey done every year on honeybee losses across the United States, and uh, Pennsylvania, unfortunately, is kind of near the, the, the top of honeybee loss. I, I believe, I'd have to check the statistics again, but I believe Honeybee loss in Pennsylvania last year was around 40%. Mm. What business can stay in business when they lose 40% of their you know, workforce or crop or, or income or whatever it is? I mean, that's, those are big losses. So, yeah, it, it, it's kind of messy, and, and there is a lot of research going on at Penn State and other land-grant universities. But unfortunately, it, you know, it's pretty hard to pin down exactly what's going on. There are multiple problems, we think. Um, uh, that these honeybees are experiencing. So um, the, the one, there is a lot of research up at Penn State looking at the issue with pesticides, and, and I do think that's a, a bit of a problem. Uh, these, these honeybees are exposed to pesticides. It may not be killing them outright, but it may be weakening them, uh, unable to do uh, deal with some of the other issues, things that they're exposed to. In my opinion, and this is a, this is a lot of debate within the, the uh, beekeeping community, but I think the biggest problem with our honeybees is this varroa mite. And think of a tick on a, on a human body. Mm-hmm. A, a tick attaches itself to the body. It's taking out some resources out of the human body, but it also has the ability to, to move some viruses, some disease organisms throughout our body. And that's the same thing with this varroa mite on the honeybee body. It attaches itself to the exterior of the body. It starts feeding on the honeybee uh, fat, not blood, but honeybee fat. In the process, it's also moving some viruses into this, these honeybee colonies. For example, the one virus is called the deformed wing virus. So pretty descriptive. Yeah. If this honeybee has this virus, you can imagine it has wings that are deformed. And, um, and they, they're not very good workers. In fact, they're just kind of useless. Hmm. 
So that's just one of the viruses. There's a multitude of uh, viruses that are moving throughout this population. And to, in my opinion, that the varroa mite is, is the number one issue. And, and beekeepers have been battling this for, for years, trying to manage them. And um, so, that yeah. yeah that the whole, other one is, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that whole science uh, has, has probably really opened up and, and when you have disasters of this nature, we're talking about coronavirus and how quickly the science, com- scientific community is responding to it, uh, searching for solutions. It's been that way for a few years now. Um, the research has really expanded in, in the bee colonies. Yeah, it, it has. Um, it, it's, it's, but it, this is, per, you know, when we make, who knows what's going to happen with this coronavirus, but, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with a lot of these microorganisms, it can be pretty tricky, and so... They have been studying this for several years, but really haven't been able to kind of nail down. And, and again, I think part of the problem is it's just not the varroa mite. Um, they're under several stressors. So, um, you know, they're, uh, they've got the varroa mite. They've got the viruses. Uh, the small hive beetle was starting to invade these hives. Uh, there is habitat loss and destruction. Um, we do think there's a, a bottleneck on some of these the genetics, um, and that's a problem. Um, so, yeah, it, it's no different than humans. If you're working, um, you know, let's say you're working 20 hours a day, consecutive days, uh, you're not eating healthy, you're not getting that proper amount of sleep, your body wears down, and then you open yourself up to, uh, you know, all these stressors, you know, maybe some sort of bacteria, cold, virus, or whatever. And it's the same thing with these honeybees. They are just being pummeled with all these stressors, and they're weakened, and they're open up to, to a lot of problems. We only have about 30 seconds left with Tom Butzler. Uh, Tom, last thing, did the mild winter help or hurt the bee colony? Uh, you know, these bees over the generations, just, just, you know, you can go far back as you want. Um, they have been either evolved or created to withstand harsh winters. And so I, I, I don't think whether this winter was cold or mild really impacts them. I, I, I don't. Uh, you know, if we had a really cold winter, they're it. As long as they have food, we try to leave around 60 pounds of honey behind for them in that hive. As long as they have access to food, they can survive. Mm -hmm. Um, I think maybe with these warmer winters, that may be a little detrimental. They may go, um, uh, you know, just not hunker down and just kind of in that resting stage. It might be a little more harmful, but we'll have to see what the next survey looks like. Yeah, yeah, terrific. Hey, good stuff today, Tom. I appreciate so much you're spending some time with us. Yep, no problem. Uh, everyone enjoy this uh, nice uh, weather today. It's supposed to get cold again. So. <laughs> well, there's a hopeful note. Hey, have a great day today. <laughs> All right, thank you. It is the voice of Indiana County, WCCS, AM 1160 and 101.1 FM. And Fox News is coming up next at the top of the hour. Next at the top of the hour. Next.